said, I'm Elizabeth Chance. I'm in my second year at UCF. Um, I'm not a full-time student, so my second year is technically what should have been the first year. So I'm just beginning my research. My thesis topic will be water mills located in Central Florida. Um, and I will kind of be going, over, oh, going through an overview of my planned research methods and what my intended outcomes will be. So Central Florida, for the for my research and for this presentation, I'm going to concentrate mostly on Orange, Seminole, Lake, and possibly Osceola counties. Um, if during the course of my research I find that I need to expand that, of course I obviously will, but for now, I'm just concentrating on those four. Um, plan on studying the time period after the Civil War and into the early 1900s for a couple reasons. They, the availability of data is much more prevalent and that makes things easier for myself. Um, the change in population after the Civil War it was significant. And of course the changes in industry after the Civil War were also significant. So there will be a change from basic industry into a larger industry. So my first focus will be on creating a predictive model. So what I'll be doing is I'll be looking to locate possible mill sites using things like GIS, which I'll explain later, and then conducting a site survey of a, of a mill that I can find and that it will be, provide significant information for analysis. So industrial archaeology is mostly where I fit. Um, it's the study of artifacts or material culture having to do with social, economic, and technological development within the last 250 years. Um, there are some industrial archaeologists that go further back. They go to the Greeks. Um, that's as far as I've read so far. Um, but Michael Ricks of the University of Birmingham in England is the one that kind of is, gets credit for coining this term industrial archaeology. And he came up with the idea that rather than just preserving these sites or preserving these monuments, that we really need to collect information on them to take the data that we can collect and study them and in turn understand our industrial past. So some major industries that I'll be looking at will be lumber, sugar, and grist mills. These, the lumber industry grew from the northwest and it kind of grew out of speculators from the north who moved down into Florida and what they were looking for were, were replacement resources for what they had demolished in the north. And when they came down to Florida, they found the pine wood. And so um, the Spaniards and the British before had also found the same resources. The cool thing about West Florida is it also has plenty of water resources. So not only does it have the lumber, it has the water resources to process that lumber. And that led to the Arcadia Mill Complex. Sugar or cane sugar mills were more of a plantation era type item and grist was produced only on a local level. Um, it was not really used for a larger production. It was never exported. And these are some mills, De Leon Springs and at Homosassa that's a sugar mill. And the, the mill at De Leon, you can actually see the spillway from where the water would come out of the water mill. So there were two excavated sites that I've been able to research so far at this point in my research. The Arcadia Mill Complex and the Hewitt Mill, and they are both in Florida. Arcadia Mill is in the northwest, Hewitt is in the northeast. Uh, Arcadia was excavated by a gentleman by the name of John Phillips of University of West Florida. He's since retired. It is the largest number of sites that have been excavated and published on. He, he has published these in academic journals. He's presented on them. They range from the British period up until the early American period all the way up into the Depression, actually. So the Hewitt Mill was excavated by a name, um, man named William M. Jones. He was not a trained archaeologist, um, he, but he did also publish his information in a, in a magazine. So his information is available and you can find it. Um, the Hewitt Mill was a British period site, so it's, it's much later than some of the Arcadia Mills. Um, in this picture, you can see the water. And a lot of the problem that you, you have with excavating these sites is they are near water, 
And in Florida, a lot of times you have to wait for the water table to go down before you can actually go out and excavate. So it took him several years to excavate this. So the West Florida sites, there were 58 total. They are all within the confines of the Escambia River. The sites were usually found by the large earthen dams that they would build to contain the water used for the mills. You can actually still see these structures because as the as the mill would run, these dams would kind of fall apart and they would have to reinforce them with pilings. The older ones would use wood, newer ones you can find concrete. So these dams are what I'm going to use for my predictive model and also using aerial photography. It's part of the way that he found them and I'm going to use them the same methods. So the dams are often from about 60 to 1,000 feet long, 10 to 100 feet wide and 15 to 16 feet or 5 to 16 feet high. So, so the West Florida locations, they all occur in narrow stream valleys. There are three in an estuary, 23 on a river terrace, and 32 in the uplands. And these are great areas to look for. And what these sites do, uh, in West Florida do is they present data about settlement patterns and about the industry of the different occupations of that area. So I can take the data from these sites, where they were located, what they were used for, the populations that they supported, and then I can build on that on what I find out about Central Florida. So there were a total of 22 early American mills that had been dated to 18th century and early 19th century. Um, these 20. Um, using the information about the 23 Arcadia sites on river traces, I can look at similar scenarios around about the same time and hopefully find some here in Central Florida. So William M. Jones, this is in the Northeast, um, he found and surveyed 15 other sites besides the Hewitt Mill. He worked on the Hewitt Mill and these other 15 sites between 1952 and 1993. He so what he was able to do, the data that he collected from the site surveys and from the excavation, though he was untrained, is very informative, especially for me, because it gives me an opportunity of ways that I can find my own sites, as well as, so between this one and between the Arcadia, put them together, and it, it should lead me in the right direction, so we'll see. Um, this was found around, along a tributary of the Pelliser Creek, um, the swamp that it was located in had been surveyed by a British surveyor, and he documented that it was an excellent location due to its naturally high dams. And of course, it ended up working out well. Um, there, Williams found a trash, trash pit or a midden pit, a buried wooden platform, and wrought iron items, such as broad axes, timber dogs, nails. Um, he did find ceramics. The ceramics would indicate that there was, there was a settlement there, or a, a housing unit, though um, William never found that. So the predictive modeling part of my thesis is what I'm working on now. The idea is that finding sites and the known features of those sites and narrowing the focus, I can save myself the many hours that it takes out in the field to actually find these sites. Um, I don't have forever to finish my thesis. So I kind of need to know where to look before I go out and spend time in the field. This picture over here is a predictive model by a CRM company or a cultural resource management company in Minnesota. And what they did was they took features about pre-contact Indian sites or Native American sites and they inputted that into GIS and it popped out a model of where other sites might possibly be found. And they can use that before going into the field. So if Minnesota wanted to put a road through here, they would know we need to survey that site. We need to do more than just a pedestrian survey where they walk around if they see artifacts, they know there's a site. We need to go out and we need to do test pits. We need to do this many test pits. They need to be this far apart. And so predictive modeling honestly has change the way archaeology approaches finding sites. 
And so it, it also applies to other things other than archaeology. They use them for flood models, future land use, climate changes. Pretty, pretty useful. So for my particular predictive model, I'll be looking at the hydrology. So rainfall, the aquifer at the time, runoff, anything that would have affected the water flow of the area. The land features, the land was very different then, now it's developed. So there's not roads, or there weren't roads. There were hills that are possibly not there any longer. There were lakes that have been filled in, there are swamps that have been filled in. So taking the hydrology data from the early 19th century, or I'm sorry, late 19th century, early 20th, I can find those. Um, historical documents will play a part in that. Some mills have been documented, but their location has been lost. And then of course population, just spelled wrong, um, population will tell me where the concentration of people were, and the kind of, all those four together should pop out sites. We'll see. Um, so just a quick overview of GIS in case we don't know what it is. Geographic Information Systems. It takes geography and it takes the spatial data of an area and it puts it together for a presentation type map. So the real world is what you would see on Google Earth or aerial photographer, photography. Over top of that, you can put a land use and you can say, well, this property is being used for agriculture. I'm gonna color it orange. And then elevation can be a gradient color. You can put the parcels on top of that, streets on top of that. And then of course, if you're trying to find people or populations of people, you can put that on top. The coolest part, if you want to, you can turn the elevation off and that disappears off your map. It's no longer there. And so then you can see only the land use parcels. It's very, very useful. Civil engineering has been using it for years. The property appraisers, if you go on property appraisers website and you look up your parcel, that's GIS. That's what they used. These are the two maps that I've so far been able to compile. This is a political map of Central Florida. It includes Orange, um, Orange Lake, and Seminole counties. On top of that, I have laid the major rivers. So I know where they're at in relation to the political boundaries. Over here is a LIDAR picture of the same area of Orange County. On top of that LIDAR image, I have put the hydrology data for Orange County. And so again, out pops all of the water. So these are two that I will be continuing to use and building on. Um, I'll be putting known sites on this map and hopefully being able to find the type of water that I would need. So in conclusion, I, I plan to use a predictive model, historical documentation, and a site survey. A site survey is much like you see here, I took this off a thesis by another UCF graduate, Deb Zeal. She did a site survey of a juke joint out in Avon Park, and she went out there and she surveyed the site and she documented what she found, and that is what I look to, to do. Um, I'll be creating a layout of the Central Florida Mill and documenting the cultural material I'll be able to find. <coughs> Elizabeth Chance, our next speaker for a mini symposium will be Ellen Marie Garcia Cosme. She will be presenting spatial patterns of race fields and linguistic diversity in Mojos, Beni, Bolivia. Awesome. <laughs> Join me in welcoming Ellen Marie. Thank you, everyone. And like Kevin said, I will be speaking on spa spatial patterns of race fields and how they correlate with linguistic diversity in Mojos, Beni, Bolivia. And I am currently in the final stages of my thesis, so hopefully what I've found so far, there'll be a couple changes, but this is pretty much it. <laughs> so here, um, just like I stated, I'll be looking at raised fields in, uh, in Bolivia, and so right here is a map of Bolivia and the whole country itself. 
and here are actually race fields that have been mapped out by students at UCF and these are the race fields that was used in my analysis. And so what I'll be doing is looking at the spatial patterns of these fields and how they relate to other features in the area. So overall, just to give you a little background of where Bolivia is and where, um, where Mopos is, it is actually part of the overall region of Amazonia, which spans from Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, all throughout the South America, and it is outlined here in this top picture. This is actually the forest that's outlined. Mm -hmm but it extends further out down here where Mobiles is. So Amazonia itself is actually extremely diverse linguistically and ethnically. And with this diversity comes a lot of ideas that are diffused through these different groups of different exchange networks. And so um, my biggest, what I was interested in was the landscape modification. How are groups modifying the landscape? How are they using the environment? You know, for what best worked best for them? So what I focused on were earthworks, and as you see in this bottom image here, these are actually geoglyphs in Brazil. And they are one type of earthwork that is found throughout Amazonia in general. And these are believed to have ritual or ceremonial um, aspects to them, and they weren't living spaces necessarily. But earthworks themselves, have, they're, they're not just geoglyphs, they're also mounds that people created or that we're living on. There were also ring ditches that, that people created that are similar to these right here, circular in nature. And so, but for my research, what I focused on was race fields, which are agriculture. Now, the linguistic diversity in Amazonia is pretty intense. Outside of New Guinea, it is actually the most linguistic area in the world. So they're about equal when it comes to language families. In Amazonia, there are about 300, which are then subdivided into smaller language families. And the four major language families are the Tupi, the Arawak, the Carib language families, and the Macro G. And for my research, the Arawak language family was the main focus, which is seen here, their distribution. So it goes all the way through, all the way up like this, and actually goes into the Caribbean. So at the time of European contact, they were actually the most widely dispersed language family. And so my interest in the Arawak is that they're the ones that are attributed with constructing all of these earthworks and diffusing the ideas of how to use these earthworks. And it's actually a little more complex than that. It's not just one group that is using these earthworks. It's not just one group that's creating them. So I wanted to see, well, in Mohos, who is using them? Like, is it just the Arawak or are there other language families that are using them? And so what, the, what ties back to the Arawak is that they were part of a regional exchange network. And in this network, they were moving up and down rivers throughout the Amazon and kind of communicating and interacting with other groups. And through this interaction, it is possible that they were passing on these ideas of how to use the landscape and how to use it in a way that worked best for everybody, that was efficient, and that just kind of tied back to their cultural beliefs and practices. So to the race field, which is an earthwork that they're actually attributed to doing, it's the race fields themselves are agricultural in nature, and they have several definitions. The term itself is general and has been defined by William Dedevin, a leading scholar in Bolivia, as artificially elevated fields. And also, they've also been defined as by Clark Erickson, who in a way is kind of like an advisor to me through, <laughs> through generations. He defines them broadly as race fields that are on, they're large elevated planting surfaces that are elevated above the flood spanas. And so raised fields themselves are, they're not found just in Mojos, they are found throughout other countries. They're found in the Guiana, Suriname, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and they're even found in the Lake Titicaca Basin in Bolivia. So they're widely used, but they do vary in shape, size, orientation. So the ones I will be focusing on are called large raised fields. And so as you see in the top image here, this is an image I took myself this summer in Bolivia. And this is the actual field and this is the canal where they were possibly getting the earth from. So as you can see, they're difficult to see on the ground. I wasn't very sure what I was standing on when I got there, but that is a race field, I promise you guys, I'm not lying. So <laughs> this right here is the field and that's the canal. But then as you see down here on satellite imagery, they're actually easier to see. As you, look, you can see that um, when you compare the vegetation, they're lighter in color. And when you, when you zoom in enough, that you can see that they're actually completely outlined and they're very elongated. So for most of, most of the research and for most of the digitizing for my research, um, the, a lot of graduate, undergraduate students were mapping them on Google Earth and then converting it into GIS, which is where GIS comes to play in my research. 
just to kind of give you an idea of where I'm at, so Mojos is this area all right here in the Beni Department of Bolivia. So it's all this lighter coloring here. And it's part of the Southwest Amazon and the major river there, the Mamore River, drains into another river that goes right into the Amazon. So they are tributaries of the Amazon, which is how they kind of connect through this larger network and this larger interaction and communication with groups throughout the region. So it is actually a large savanna, and there are areas of forest, usually around the rivers, but it's mostly open savanna. And within this, within Mohawk, there's actually many different linguistic groups. But at the time of Jesuit contact during um, the Spanish era, which lasted about 100 years from the 17th to 18th century, there were only six major groups that were distinguished, at least that they considered important and they considered distinct. And these groups are the Moho and the Baude, which are Arawak groups. And then there were the Cayubaba, the Itonoma, the Movima, and the Canichana. And these groups are all considered linguistically isolated. So no one's really sure what language group they would fall into or if they've even been able to kind of keep track of where they would fall. So my interest actually goes into the Cayubaba and Movima, which are linguistically isolated. And as you'll see in my further slides, there are race fields in these areas. So that makes it a little interesting. So. For my research itself, as I stated, I'll be looking at the spatial patterns found within race fields and other features. And the other features that I am focusing on are forest islands and the river networks. The forest islands themselves, why they're important is that they are potentially areas of habitation. Through past research by my advisor, they have seen that majority of these fields have evidence of habitation. There are ceramics, there are foreign soils, there's anthro soils. So there's all these different things that kind of give you evidence that people were living there, but it's not quite, you know, people aren't living there anymore. So you can't really say, you know, this is where they lived year round. The area floods about three or four months out of the year. So these these forest islands are actually elevated and would be ideal for people to live on during these flood seasons to kind of avoid from getting you know, drawn away in the water. And for the rivers, they're important to my research is that they're the network that move people around. They allow people to communicate, to interact. So I just wanted to see how, where are these race fields in, in terms of the rivers? Where are they in terms of where people are living? So I just want to see how do these race fields tie to the overall network in the Amazon? And so I was able to use GIS to kind of create these maps of where the race fields are distributed, where the forest islands are found, and then overlay it with linguistic groups, with missions from the Jesuit period, and kind of tie it back to kind of ethno-historical accounts and all the background that's been done in the Amazon. And for my research, just to kind of do a comparison, I divided it between the north and south. So the north is this part here with these two with these two rivers, which are the Iruñanes River at the top and the Omi right here at the bottom. And then the bottom set of rivers, which is the Yakuma and the Rampula Rivers. And so I divided them by these two rivers, which also tie to different linguistic groups in the area and with two major missions from the Jesuit period. So, and just as an example to show how the fields are digitized and how many there are in the area kind of zoomed in, these have been digitized by some undergraduate students at UCF, and so they go in and one by one do these fields, and then I was able to transport them into campus. An issue with all the fields is that it's multiple people, multiple people that are mapping these fields. So it'll be one field mapped five times. So to kind of solve for that issue, I created neighborhoods of, of fields. And these fields were created with 10 meter buffers. So within 10 meters around these fields, they were probably moving up the earth to create the fields, or kind of the, the boundaries are fuzzy. They're not necessarily preserved that well. So it's hard to tell, well, where does it stop? Where does it end? Where's the next field start? Where does it end? So when I created these neighborhoods, I just, I was like, okay, well, now let me see how far are they from the rivers and how close. The two distances that I chose are 700 meters and 1,000 meters. And these are based on agricultural theories that I found through my research that show that within these distances, there are actually walking distances that allow individuals or groups to walk to and from the, the islands or the fields in a day. So it's about a 15 minute walk. And so this is assuming that this is during the dry season that they're taking care of these fields. And it's also, and it's also during a time that, you know, are they living around the, the river? So this is what I've done so far. 
for 700 meters for race fields to rivers, and then race fields to the rivers at 1,000 meters. And as you can see, it's not that big of a difference. But then again, when you look at numbers, it actually goes up about 200 neighborhoods in difference. So I guess there's, there's something there. Then I did a similar thing with the forest islands to see are they living closer far to rivers. And again, as you can see, it's not much of a difference there. But in number, again, it does go up about 30 or 40 forest islands. And here I did the same thing to see where the, where the race fields are in regards to the forest islands themselves. Are they farming close to where they're living, or are they going out of their way to go a little further? So as you can see here, there are a lot, a lot of neighborhoods closer to the forest islands than there were to the rivers. And the change itself actually goes up drastically. It goes up, up about 350 neighborhoods when you go at 1,000 meters versus 700 meters. Then lastly, I tied in the missions. That's where we get most of the information about the linguistic groups and the groups that were living in the area is from the missions themselves. So I wanted to see where were the Jesuits planting themselves in regards to where people were living. And so these two missions here are where the Cayubaba and the Movima were kind of centered during the Jesuit periods because during that time they tried to kind of squeeze in and force all the groups together in one area. Kind of an easier way to kind of keep track of everyone. So I wanted to see where were the missions in regards to the distribution and then how does the distribution look within the linguistic groups. And I also did go through one by one and put the linguistic groups over each, over each spatial pattern, over each analysis that I did, just to see how it looks and how it relates, you know, who's, who has more fields in their area or not, saying north versus south. So what I've seen is that there are similarities and differences between the north and the south. They do both have the same type of race fields but the density of these fields is different. It's not necessarily, they don't all have the same amount of fields in their areas. So it was interesting to see that, but then for in the north, they seem to have more fields, but there's more islands in the south. So it just kind of makes you wonder, well, were the fields preserved better in the north than they were in the south? Were they, were they newer? These fields date back to about 1,000 about a thousand or 2,000 years ago. So they've been around for a while. And it does show that they are living close to these rivers, at least from what it seems so far, at least what we've been able to digitize. So they are possibly moving up and down the rivers and communicating and being able to say, hey, these race fields work. They work for what we need to grow. That's what I've gotten so far. And I just want to say thank you to the undergraduate mappers for doing all their hard work and to my mind. presenter for the UCF graduate student mini symposium will be Anthony Tricario, who will be presenting Terracing Urban Space, Agricultural Potential at Monte Alban, Oaxaca. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Tricario. Hey, Kevin. Um, so I'm also in my second year at UCF, um, finishing up my master's degree and also finishing up my thesis. And as Kevin said, I'll be uh, talking tonight about measuring agricultural potential at Monte Alban. Um, tonight, I'd like to discuss the interplay between urban agriculture and population density. I'd like to discuss the use of spatial analysis tools like GIS to estimate agricultural potential at Monte Alban, which is the ancient Zapotec capital in Mexico, in order to extrapolate a model of measuring this interplay. Finally, I'd like to discuss how this Urban, uh, ancient urban agriculture can inform modern methods of similar nature. So Monte Oban, you see right here is a satellite image of this nice image we see here, uh, was the ancient Zapotec capital, uh, essentially located in the Valley of Oaxaca, which is in the southern Mexican highlands. The Valley of Oaxaca is Y-shaped, and it was divided up into three different valleys. The Atwa Valley in the north, the Tulacuba Valley in the east, and the Valle Grande region in the south. Human occupation of this valley predates 12,000 years, which in the archaeological record also predates the evidence of earliest, earliest evidence of intensive agriculture in the archaeological record. 
the site totals 6.5 kilometers uh, square kilometers, and dates as far back to 500 BCE. There are multiple competing hypotheses, though, for the origins of Mount Yawa. The prevailing notion within the field is what Richard Blanton, another fellow archaeologist, refers to as disembedded capital model. This theory states that Mount Yabon was founded on mutually contested land, and that in order to resolve internal strife between those members in the, in the valley, each arm came together to form a new capital. Mount Yabon became a fully uh, independent Zapotec polity in around 200 BCE, and in the, late class, in the early classic and 350 CE, population levels reached 25,000. And you see by the late classic, which is the period I focus on, population levels are up to 30,000. So for my thesis, I mapped uh, over 1,200 terraces at Mount Yaman. Um, of the total 1,400 terraces that were originally mapped by the Valley of Oaxaca Settlement uh, Pattern Project, and these, all these terraces were originally included as residential. However, my analysis using GIS showed that this simply was not possible, and there in terms was arable land that could be used for agriculture. So GIS was useful to me for three different ways. I was able to visualize my hypothesis, I was able to manage the large data set, and I was also to develop, able to develop a predictive model of agricultural potential. I combined each of these terraces that I mapped with 13 different individual data sets, such as terrace area, total structural area, estimated function, number of residences, visible structure features, ceramic distribution, uh, whether they were close to a source of water, such as drainage or spring, and also other features such as structural fragments, topography, and whether they were currently used today for modern agriculture. Now these data sets were used to as I said, create a spatial analysis of Monte Yaban, which challenged previous notions that there is no agricultural space. So I first started looking at whether there was, how much structural area there was in each of these terraces. It would have been very easy for me here if I was able to find that all of the terraces mapped had less than 50% structural area. This means that there was a large chunk of terrace available for other purposes such as agriculture. However, as we see in this map, uh, there's only 56 terraces that had a label the uh, known structural area. Of those 56, however, 46 had structural areas less than 50% of the total terrace. Uh, now this is 82%, so I figured, you know, it would have been easy to say, okay, you know, 82% of the terraces were could be used for agricultural purposes. However, seeing that I had over 1,400, 1,200 terraces mapped. Uh, this 56 was not a large enough data set for that assumption. So I need to use another variable to start with to sort out the terraces. So I sorted them first by water availability. Water availability in the Valley of Oaxaca is, uh, is the limiting factor in the valley. Uh, rainwater runoff comprises the majority of water available at Monte Alban, and also as you see here, very limited springs. Um, and these bodies of water aren't this large, I simply enlarge that into, so we can visualize that tonight. Now within the Valley of Oaxaca, uh, various areas receive rainwater anywhere from 600 millimeters to 1,000 millimeters of rainfall a year. Um, rainwater flows through Monte Yaban through a series of drainage areas, which I've mapped on this map here. Um, and it's also possible that agricultural fields were being watered through a method called splash irrigation. Now splash irrigation is taking literally taking a large storage vessel and carrying it to a source of water, filling it up and then taking it back to your uh, terrace to water the field. Now this method is not going to water a large, plant, uh, large crop like we know today, but it would have watered very adequately small terraces. So knowing that, I looked at the area of terraces that were within 50, 100, and 150 meters around uh, areas of drainage. And I determined I wanted to see how far residents were willing to walk in order to receive water. And within 50 meters of the drainage area, there were originally 222 terraces. However, I limited this number down to 195 based upon ceramic density and number of matates. Matates are simply grinding stones that are characteristic of residential activity areas, and they are very large, so these were not going to be moved. So I automatically assumed that these terraces are residential in nature. 
Now, as you can see, as we move further out, at 100 meters, we have 420 terraces based upon my previous uh, requirements that could have been used for agriculture. If we move to 150 meters, this number increases dramatically from the beginning to 633 terraces. I also did the same uh, for the various springs around the site. We see 50 meters, it also increases all the way up to 150. At 150 meters, there are 76 terraces that could have been watered through splash irrigation. Now this is, uh, also assumes that there were low ceramic densities and also uh, contained no evidence of mitates. Now with this, I combine all this information into the beginning of my model for agricultural potential. Uh, outlined in red are those uh, terraces that were within 150 meters of a drainage area and blue is those terraces that were within 150 meters of a spring. I wanted to see where each of these areas combined so I could find which of the sites, the terraces, had the highest agricultural potential. Um, also, terraces that are used by modern farmers for agricultural purposes are more likely to have been a source of agricultural productivity in the past based upon a theory uh, I use called resilience theory. Uh, resilience theory states that processes that occurred in modern systems are resilient forms of past systems. Now based upon these data sets I've been talking about, I was able to divide these terraces up into three different categories. Those where agriculture is possible, those where agriculture was highly likely, and those terraces that had the highest potential of agricultural productivity. Now the first step in determining uh, which the degree of individual terraces had, uh, which terraces had a degree of uh, agricultural productivity. I needed to determine the extent of water availability, which I did here. And I took all the areas that were outlined in red and the terraces that fell in with them and separated them out into this own separate map. This map told me which terraces were fed by both sources of water. Now this is, I couldn't just say that these terraces had the highest potential based upon my theoretical model, which assumed that terraces that, also, that are fed by both spring and drainage areas also had to be used for modern agriculture. So I took this as a starting point to determine which, which terraces had the highest potential, and then looked uh, separated that out once more. So I was able to see that these 13 terraces, uh, some are a little small, we can't really see them, uh, had the highest potential based upon their ability to both uh, be fed by both spring and drainage area, and also have low ceramic densities, contain no ancient residences, um, were used for modern agricultural purposes. And based upon four, before, they had no evidence of residential structures or debris, such as mitates. Now, once more, I looked at those terraces that are near spring, and those terraces that were near a drainage area, to find out Okay, so these terraces weren't the highest potential, but did they have potential to grow any crops? And those terraces that are defined by a high likelihood of agricultural potential were those that were defined by low ceramic density and were fed by one uh, source of water, and those that were also might have been used for uh, modern agriculture, but not necessarily, and have no evidence of residential debris and also no, no structural debris. And those terraces that were defined as being having a potential for agriculture, but not necessarily likely, um, have a low ceramic density and were near a source of water. However, uh, and they also contain no evidence of matantes and no evidence of ancient residences. Um, and above, like I said, all these terraces that either have high or are potential for agriculture. So I used GIS to combine the previous maps with these two in order to find a total evidence, uh, a total uh, agricultural potential map at Monte Alban. I was able to determine that 677 terraces out of the 1,273 I mapped had um, ability to have been farmed by ancient populations. This is about 53% um, of the total terraces you see here. Now this means that at a maximum there is 388,000 388 uh, square meters of arable land, which is a significant amount um, over previous estimates, which said that there was uh, no agricultural land in Monte Alban. 
Now this number assumes, uh, takes into account the known structural areas, which will also will be refined once we have structural areas for any of the terraces. Um, but assuming that those 56 terraces were the only ones that had structural debris, uh, 388,000 is actually the maximum uh, amount of arable land at the site. Now through this, I was able to come through, uh, come through various implications. Uh, my research is highly, uh, this term, uh, applied archaeology, which looks at past societies and applies the principles of those societies to modern times. Um, now based upon these estimates uh, of the land, land estimates I was talking about, uh, urban agriculture of Monte Bond was highly bilateral in use, meaning each of the terraces were not used only for residential purposes or only for agricultural purposes. They were defined by mixed use. Now, this implies that agriculture within dense populations in general is also multi-use uh, in its most efficient form. So I applied this principle to modern applications and sought, uh, tried to determine how modern urban agriculture could have been more efficient and more productive. And I determined that based upon what I saw here, that modern urban agriculture um, that we see today, and typically in the form of community gardens, which are small plots, um, these plots could not uh, sustain more than 20 people at most. They're mainly used for educational purposes. Um, their most efficient form will be a multi-use, um, instead of just using for agriculture. Um, now this uh, study underwrites uh, architectural studies that are uh, currently being done, uh, which actually are seeking to create multi-use sites that combine agriculture and residential area. Uh, and my research in general used archaeological principles to validate and predict the efficiency of future urban agricultural initiatives and modern cities across the country. Thank you.